Welcome back to Making with Z. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about the lathe behind me again, uh, specifically the chuck. So we're going to talk about how the chuck works, and uh, this one has the D14 cam lock uh, mount. So we're going to cover how the chuck, how to install it, remove it, and some basics on chucks. So let's get going. Okay, guys. So this is another video on my Grizzly G4003 lathe. It's a 12 by 36 lathe. And in this video, we're going to be talking about uh, the chuck on the lathe. So first thing for safety, make sure, in my case, I don't even have power to the lathe now, but make sure that there's no way you're going to be able to turn the lathe on. And the other thing, because we're not using power for this, uh, you don't want the lathe in gear. So here, if it's in gear, it's much harder to turn. So on this lathe, there's no neutral, but you just move it over until you're in between gears. So I can put it here and now it's very easy to turn as you can see. So the first thing is let's move the carriage out of the way. So on this lathe we've got a three jaw scroll self-centering chuck. Six inch which means it's six inch in diameter and it's got three jaws they come together at the same time. Uh, on a scroll mechanism. So we'll talk about that. There's different chucks out there that are available. There's two, three, four, six jaws. Um, and I'll talk about what else came with this one was the four jaw and it's an independent four jaw. So it's not a scroll. You independently move the jaws. Um, <clears throat> so on this particular lathe, what we'll do first And anytime you're removing the chuck or doing anything on the chuck with the jaws, it's a good idea to put a piece of plywood down so in case you drop something it doesn't put a dent uh, in your lathe bed. So <clears throat> you can see here, I have these etched but I also put them in a marker. There's numbers here, one, two, and three. And the reason I'm doing that, we'll start first. Um, we will, well let me show you first how this works. So if you've never played with one of these, um, you know, you just move it counterclockwise and the jaws open. And what you got to be also careful of, and I'll see if I can put it in the, the video here for this one, is you can only go so far with these jaws. So you got to be careful. So here's about the limit of the diameter that I can clamp with these jaws. If I go any further out, I'm not going to have enough engagement here to clamp it safely and if you go too far out it may just come off while you're turning or putting some loads on it so in your application make sure you know look how far these jaws go and what's safe to clamp a lot of them do list it in the manual uh, that you get with it for what the capacity is so in this case you know you just visually see what I'm able to clamp. And same thing goes for anything that if I was clamping on the ID with these other jaws, same thing. I don't want to really exceed what it's capable of. So on these jaws, you know, something like that uh, would work. And the other thing is never leave this chuck key in the chuck for any reason. Just make it a habit to always take it out uh, because you could start it potentially and it would throw it out, throw it out at you and potentially hurt you. So, so there's how it works in general. Now let's look at what it takes to remove the jaws. So <clears throat> number three will always be the one that comes out first. So what I do is I rotate it down and I come up here and then I just turn counterclockwise and I kind of keep a hand on it and you'll feel when it falls out. Okay, there it is. So there's number three. Number two will be next. So I'll put it down and move it. And it fell out. And then number one will be last. And there we go. So now we can see, once we have all the jaws off, hopefully you guys can have a good view of this. So I'll turn it over to uh, slot number one. And now you can see the scroll part here. And as I turn it, you can see it's turning. And what you want to watch is up here at the very top, you can see this where the 
top part of the scroll disappears and comes into view. And that's important for reinstalling the jaws back into the chuck. So to put the jaws back into the chuck, like I said, we're, we're going to watch the scroll here. And once the top scroll comes into view there, we've got to just make sure it's all the way back, out of the way. And make sure we grab jaw number one. They're all labeled. And you just slide it into the slot and hold it down just gently and give clockwise turn on the chuck key and just feel if it grabbed. Then move on to number two and as you turn the chuck key again watch for the slot coming in. And you see it came in so back it out of the way. Grab jaw number two, slide it in and turn and then once you feel it grab go on to number three. So now I'm at number three, and I'm going to look for, there it is, it's coming into view, and I push it back out of view, and I grab number three. And same thing, you just let it drop, turn it, and it grabs. So now all three have grabbed, and this is the most extreme position that you can have them in. You definitely never want to clamp anything with the jaws out this far. So let's go ahead and just push them in. Now if you did this wrong, uh, you'll know it right away. When all three come together, they won't come together equally. So here I'm close, and it looks like it's good. So I do have them labeled one, two, and three, and I always keep one and one. I don't think it's critical that you do it, but it's not a bad idea. But you do have to go in that order of one, two, and three. Otherwise, they will not come together and it won't function. <laughs> So the chuck that comes on the grizzly lathe also comes with another set of um, jaws. Some lathes have reversible jaws that you can just reverse for OD and ID. Um, some of them have it where these, this part of the, the jaw stays in the chuck and you can just bolt them on uh, to the end. So in this case it comes with another set of jaws and you can see these jaws uh, compared to what I had before gripping that same piece of stock you know, it allows me to grip larger ODs, uh, but again, you know, depending on what you're working on, it gives me less room here. You know, if I was coming in with a tool, you'd have to be really careful. I'd have to be turning out here. So, comes with two sets of jaws, um, and really for hobbyists like me, it, it works out really well. Uh, it covers pretty much the capacity that I need. <laughs> All right, while we have the jaws off the chuck, uh, what I did is I put an indicator on the carriage and got it on the OD of the chuck to see how accurately it runs. Because the next part of it, what we're going to talk about is the D14 cam mounting. So we're going to remove the chuck completely, put it back on, and see how well it repeats if anything changes. So here I've got the indicator set to zero. It's a one-tenth indicator. So if you look at it, we're running about five-tenths as we go around and it repeats really well so we'll see what this does you know after we've removed the chuck and put it back on <laughs> all right so now we're going to go ahead and completely remove the chuck from the lathe and this is the D14 cam mount chuck so it's got three of these cam lock screws around it and what I've done is the same thing uh, with the jaws is I always like to put the chuck back in the same orientation. Uh, it probably doesn't matter either if you did shift it to the next one. Probably work best, but I think the repeatability, if you put it back where it was, uh, is your best choice. So here on the first one, and I'll try to get the catalog page here in the video too, but you've got a notch right at 12 o'clock, and you got this little arrow <clears throat> at 3 o'clock, and a little arrow at 6 o'clock. So when the chuck is locked down, you want this screw, you can see a notch in the screw, between 3 and 6 o'clock. And then to release it, we want to turn this counterclockwise up to the release part. So we'll go ahead and do that next. Okay, so here in no particular order, I'm just going to start with this one, and I'm going to turn it. And if 
if I can get it in here, if you can see it. So now my notch on the screw is up at 12 o'clock. So I started with that one, go to the next one. Again, turn it to 12 o'clock. And then on this last one, I'm, I'm going to keep a hand on the chuck so it doesn't fall off. You shouldn't. It's usually locked up on the taper, but you never know. Uh, we'll go slow. Okay. So now all three cams are released. And yeah, it's locked up on the taper a little, so we'll get a hammer and give it a little thump uh, to get it off the taper. <laughs> all right, so we got a hammer. Let's see if we can just give it a little hit here around. So we'll just pull it right off. And there we go. You can see the cam lock feature here. And I'll show you a little bit more detail. I'll, I'll move the chuck out of the way for you. Okay, so back at the spindle here on the lathe, um, I'll put the chuck key in. And here I have it, uh, the mark on the screw at the 12 o'clock position. So looking in the hole, let's take a look. You can see there's nothing there. And as I turn it towards the three o'clock position, you can start seeing a, that part coming out. And I'll turn it over to the six o'clock and then turn it back over to the 12 o'clock position. So you can see what's going on inside um, the spindle there. So also on the grizzly lathe here, you can see uh, the idea of this is a number five Morris taper and there's a through hole going through the spindle that it allows you to put uh, bar stock in here up to inch and seven sixteenths diameter. So here's the number five Morris taper. Uh, it's actually an adapter so you can put a dead center in there and I didn't clean it up really good so I'm not going to jam it in there but you can see it fits in the spindle and you could put a dead center in here and usually you'd use that with a face plate uh, with a drive dog on there to turn a piece in between centers. So while we've got the chuck off the spindle let's see what the run out of the taper looks like. Uh, I've got the indicator mounted to the ta taper and let's go ahead and just spin it. And looks like around a tenth run out, maybe a little less. So pretty good run out on the taper. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. So let's go ahead and uh, see what the face looks like. Now I've got the indicator on the face of the spindle shaft and let's go ahead and spin it and see what we got. I don't know how well you guys can see this. It's not easy to see but also around a tenth run out as I go around. So we're looking at the back of the chuck here that we removed and you can see the um, what they call them the retention studs on the back and they are loose and they're supposed to be so don't worry about that that's how it works. What, how this actually works is this screw here is what's holding it down. So if I remove this screw completely, then this uh, stud will just thread out. It'll move up and down. And the height of this stud is critical uh, for where it locks. So if we look at a manual page here that I printed out, you know, we already talked about uh, the 12 o'clock position, the 3 o'clock, and the 6 o'clock position. So if you rotate the screw and it stops before the three o'clock position, um, <clears throat> that means the retention stud has been screwed in too far and you would have to remove it. So you'd have to go back here, turn it clock counterclockwise and bring it back up and then lock it down with the screw. Now, if it ends up going too far and it goes past the six o'clock position, so <clears throat> the retention stud has not been in screwed far enough. So if that happens, if it goes past, that means you have to go in further with this stud. 
So remove the screw completely and tighten it in a little more and then put the screw back in. Um, and it'll just, you know, there's a notch there if you could see it, it hovers into that range. So you do have to adjust these if you bought a new chuck, they usually, they don't even come installed. So you gotta figure out what height they need to be and you need to gauge it by, you know, where they fall into uh, in this diagram. So when you, when the little notch in the screw has to be between three and six, ideally here would be perfect, but you're not gonna get it exact. So as long as it's within this range, that means you got a good positive lock on the chuck. So I've gone ahead and blew out everything and uh, just cleaned everything really well with a lint-free uh, cloth, paper towel, and just looking everything over, make sure it's correct. I've got that one screw up at the top that I wanted to line up that I had the magic marker. All the screws themselves are at the 12 o'clock position right now. So I've got the marker side up here, and this is the one uh, that I want to engage over here. So I'm just going to slowly go ahead and put it back in, just by hand, uh, line up the studs, and push it in. And it should relatively lock. And then I just go ahead and every screw, I'm going to turn it till it's between that uh, 3 and 6 o'clock position. I'm just going to snug them up at first. Okay. And the last one. So once you get them snugged up, you just tighten them up really well, make sure they're locked on there, and that's all there is to uh, putting D14 types of chucks or other things that you want to put in uh, to this spindle of the lathe. So really easy, really repeatable, and we'll go ahead and we'll bring an indicator in and see what it's like now after we've put it back on. So with the chuck back on, I've got the indicator mounted again, and I've zeroed it. So let's go ahead and give it a spin again, and maybe a little over five tenths, um, but pretty repeatable. And if it doesn't, what you can do also is bring it in a little bit more if you want to by tightening up some of these screws tighter. So if it was out a little, maybe we could true it up a little more. But essentially, it's back to the five tenths and you're ready to go.